Hello, welcome to the New Stack Makers, a podcast where we talk about at scale application development, deployment, and management. Okay, great. <laughs> hey, Kevin, how are you? Hey, how's it going? Thanks for having me. Great. I'm with Kevin Wang, who's the founder of FASA. Yeah. Hey. I'm Kevin Wang. I'm from FASA. Um, we're an open source management company. So we help a bunch of other companies manage all the open source that they use. And we have a focus on automating license compliance. So every single piece of open source you use, it has a license on it. And we'll help you, you know, manage and automate all the things that you need to do uh, when you have that. Great. Uh, so you brought, you brought uh, some handy dandy um, cards here. Fun cards. Yeah, look at this. This is the first, but we actually get to show fun cards. Yeah, we'll try to show it. Yeah, there it is. Yeah, okay, let's let's do that right up. Let's see that that's what it is. Let me show right at the camera. Yeah, the state of open source licensing. So, so you know, you brought the cards. We might as well go through them. Sure. Yeah, happy to talk about them. Um, so the story behind this is um, over the past year or so, we've helped over 3,000 companies manage and understand the open source that they use. Um, and part of that is we've just generated a huge amount of data around all of the open source out there. Uh, we have probably one of the largest knowledge bases on every single piece of open source and how people are using them. And on top of that, activity data of about 3,000 companies that are actively fixing license violations using our product. Um, so out of this, we created these... Fun facts and cards. We don't have to go through every single one, but there's a couple of like great insights that we've yeah. pulled out of here. Cool. So why don't we go through? How about I read it and then you can discuss it, or I'll just I'll summarize it. Oh, sure. So you so 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 FOSS is in the is in the job of managing understanding open source dependencies, mm -hmm. right? Okay. So what you've done is you've combined from over 23 million open source packages. Wow, that's a lot. Yeah. And insights from more than 3,000 development teams yeah. at Docker, HashiCorp, Mapbox, while well, use Fossa to detect and resolve licensing issues. So you work, sure. so you work with HashiCorp. I imagine that that's a company would probably really find value in this. Yeah, yeah, they're an excellent company. And the main thing is that we really focus on companies with very modern development workflows. So the new way of using open source is very, very different than uh, how people use open source like 10 years ago or so. Okay, yeah. so. How do how well do teams understand their open source dependencies? Well, I think it's really really tough today because um, the way that people use open source wasn't really built for making it super easy to understand and inspect. Uh, in fact, modern build systems are really complicated. Uh, most of the tools that developers use to actually create software um, and and build their tools pull in open source in all of these different ways. And they don't do it in a deterministic way, meaning you can have the exact same build that you run at 9 a.m. and then you run at 9 p.m. You get different packages of open source getting brought in. Wow. So we found that companies right now depend on a lot of open source. Like 90% of any application is mostly open source and third-party code. So it's a critical supplier for them, but they don't really have good telemetry and levers into understanding how to control it and how to manage it. So, so you... you you took data from 23 million, more than 23 million open source packages. Yeah. And then you combine that with insights from these developer teams. How, how did you define the methodology for the insights that you're going to gather? Yeah, well, a big part of it starts from the goals of development teams. So when you use, um, no, when you use something like FASA, typically what somebody does, they just go to our website, FASA.io, they sign up with a GitHub, import a bunch of their own code, and they configure the tool and then every single time they run a new build or they make a change to the development process, the tool gives them feedback saying, hey, it looks like this change is going to bring in a copyleft violation to your code base. Don't do that. Or when they make releases, they generate reports. So we have all this behavioral data off of how people configure the code. And because we're embedded into their workflows, um, it's actually a really, really great signal for us to learn off of because a build doesn't pass in a lot of our companies without the FOSSA check passing. So developers need to actually do work, and if FOSTA check passes the screen, that means the company is comfortable with how, whatever their goals are with open source. So you're trying to keep it very simple, right? Yeah. You know, so green means go. Green means go, red means stop. That's the world of CI, CD, right? You need those hard right. definitions. Right, green light, red light, right. Yeah. So, all right, let's move on then. So what's actually in your code? Yeah. 
and you write that in 2018, companies consume more open source packages than ever before. Mm -hmm. It's getting increasingly difficult to track the scale of code used, primarily due to three forces. There we are. Breadth of way developers share code, lack of clear structure to properly model code inclusion, inaccurate discovery tools, and low quality data. Let's go through those three points here. What are those? So those three forces, the breadth of way developers share code. Tell us about that. So some things have really blown our mind when we're working with companies. It's just all the different ways an open source package or any amount of open source code can actually get into a code base. And so when we think about what we do at FOSA, we have three major pillars. It's about the data about open source projects. It's about your ability to discover it. And then it's about the insights that we can build in the dashboard. We call it like a three Ds. And so for us, the first piece about the discovery is um, there's so many ways that you can share a piece of open source code. Uh, sometimes you can bring it through a build system like NPM, Gradle, things like that. Uh, but other times, some developers will copy and paste some code into a code base. And so that's one of the major problems when it comes to managing open source is that your developers can be doing one of a million things to actually include it. Okay. Yeah. So, and there's this lack of, lack of clear structure. Yeah. And that comes with the breadth of all the ways that you can actually share code. So if you, the de definitions around what a piece of open source is, is actually pretty tough to come by. Is it a repository? Is it a package? Is it lines of code? How do you actually define those cases? And if you don't have those strong definitions, it's very hard to automate something, especially at the rate of CI, CD. Okay. So, and then those, so, so discovery tools are, that's an interesting one. Um, how are the discovery tools these days? So that's, that's one part that's really, really tough. Yeah. And um, something that we're actually open sourcing this week is our discovery tool that powers the process of over 3,000 companies. And so, and so we've invested a lot in actually figuring out, give us an open source, uh, give us a repository, let us tell you about all the open source inside of it. And the reason why that's hard is because build systems are complicated. In a very large monolithic code base, maybe there's 10 gigabytes of code, there could be four active builds running, there could be tons of different configuration that generates a bunch of different output, there could be server code in it and client code. And so when you have all of these things mixed together and all of these very complicated builds, uh, you need really, really sophisticated tooling to be able to actually discover how those builds behave and how they bring in open source. So when we go through the rest of this, so we. So you see the hidden source of license violations. There's a lot of license violations. You talk about mislabeled components. Yeah. So this and one, th this mislabeled components one is actually something that really blew my mind when we were looking at our data. So we looked at all this data and we found some really, really counterintuitive stuff. So uh, one of the things that we found was from analyzing about 23,000 cases where people used our product to fix a license violation in their code base, uh, we found people were five times as likely to incorporate a copyleft violation by using a permissively licensed package rather than an actual copyleft one. And that really tells us a few things. Like first, first is just counterintuitive, right? Like why is that the case? But um, what I really think is it tells us that the developers aren't the ones that are fault here, right? The developers, generally they're pretty smart. They know if their company has a no GPL policy and they look at an open source package and it says GPL, they, they generally know not to use it. In our experience, we find that the majority of violations actually come from when a developer sees a permissively licensed package, and then somewhere inside of it, there's a GPL file or some deeper component that they're not really aware of, and the package then effectively it's just mislabeled. Wow! Right? Wow! wow. Just, it's just and bad how do you data. detect that? Well, that stuff that stuff is it's tough, right? Yeah. Um, because you can't just look at what the developers say in their package manifest. Almost every single tool that we see out there that's freely available allows you to check, all right, here's your dependencies, here's what it says it's licensed under. But for us, because we're a compliance company, we have to run audit grade scanning for a customer so they can pass third-party auditors. We have to scan every single line of code and every single deep dependency, do a lot of work to curate that data, do a lot of that work to filter out any, any noise, and then run that against very sophisticated policies that we set up for our companies. Wow, I'm looking at some of the other stuff. I mean, licensing data, this inaccurate tooling issue. Seven out of the top 10 package managers are non-deterministic. Yeah. Wow. And yeah. this, and you make the point that builds are continuous. Yes. So, wow. Here's the thing, like software development doesn't happen in a vacuum anymore, right? Your developers aren't writing and controlling every code. Instead, most of the code that you bring in is all this third-party stuff. And that world is constantly changing under your feet. 
So if you're not putting in best practices to lock down the open source you're using, really understand what you're using, control it, uh, you're, you end up losing control over your product and software build process. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Well, I think the last thing we just want to talk about, maybe, and then we'll conclude, is copy left and how it's still the top concern. Sure. Yeah, I mean, that's still it at the end of the day. What we've seen is we've seen a resurgence of uh, a lot of uh, new languages where copyleft licenses are actually starting to become more relevant. So I think in the history of copyleft, the traditional GPL license family became a little bit more mm -hmm. less relevant as new packages came around where it didn't necessarily hit those triggers. And especially as people develop more SaaS, uh, more of those sorts of things, you don't really see a lot of copyleft pop up, but over here now we're seeing more and more people start to care about it and more and more people start to uh, flag it again, just because we see people building software where GPL is becoming more relevant. You're using Golang, you're building binaries. If you include some GPL code in that binary, then, uh, then it's considered a covered work. So that stuff is just coming to another resurgence. Wow. Yeah. Kevin, really impressed with this. I know you have some news coming out. Please keep us posted. Sure. We really look forward to keeping in touch with your progress here. You've done a lot of the hard work and really looking at the data and making those connections and teaming with really smart people, I can tell. And so very impressed. So thank you Thanks. very much for taking the time. Thank today. you. Really appreciate really it, Alex. Thank yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Listen to more episodes of the Newstack Makers at thenewstack.io slash podcasts. Please rate and review us on iTunes, like us on YouTube, and follow us on SoundCloud. Thanks for listening, and see you next time.